And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ron, not only as my friend, but let me just say that um, Ron, in his terms as our state representative, has done more for us than other previous state representatives have ever done for us. <laughs> Maybe it's because he lives here, and I have his number on speed dial. But he has my number on speed dial, too. And, and I just want to tell you, Ron, how much we appreciate what you've done for our city uh, in your term. And, and it's not that easy sometimes when you go in as a freshman to get anybody to give you attention. But he doesn't give up. Those of you who know him, he doesn't give up. Right? Yeah. Anyway, Ron was first sworn in uh, in January of 11 as uh, state representative of House District 27, which is where you are today. He's the first African-American state representative in Fort Bend County since Reconstruction. He is a product of Fort Bend County public schools. Went to Blue Ridge Elementary, yeah, Quail Valley Middle School. He attended Texas Southern University and received a BS degree in public affairs, magna cum laude. Ron received a doctor of jurisprudence from Texas Tech. He had to go west, young man, go west, <laughs> right? Guns up, guns up, Ron. Uh, he was named, he's a named partner in the Brown, Brown and Reynolds PC law firm. He's a former associate municipal judge for the city of Houston and a TSU adjunct professor, College of Public Affairs. Ron has written numerous articles relative to consumer rights, civil rights, civic engagement, and employment law because he embodies an inherited responsibility for keeping the community abreast of current issues that impact their lives. And if you get his newsletter, you know that that's true. Ron believes that by investing in the community, he has made a positive impact on the business and economic base in Fort Bend County, commensurate with the belief to whom much is given, much is required, Ron has devoted his life to serving our community. Representative Reynolds serves on the Environment, Environmental Regulation and Technology Committee. He's married to the famous Dr. Jonita Reynolds and is a proud father of three wonderful children, of which uh, Ronald and Reagan are the two newest parts of his family that uh, take up most of his time. Anyway, welcome my good friend, State Representative Ron Reynolds. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you all for coming out today. It is such a delight to see so many friends and uh, constituents and uh, business owners and people who are engaged and involved in this community. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mayor Owen for that very kind introduction. I've known uh, the mayor well before I was a state representative. Uh, just been involved in Missouri City uh, when I was president of the NAACP in Missouri City. Uh, he was always very supportive of the NAACP uh, through Wells Fargo and through the city of Missouri City. And I think that Missouri City has a great visionary leader who is leading this city in a great direction. So let's give Mayor a moment. I also want to uh, thank the members of the city council. I think that the mayor often gets a lot of credit when things are good, a lot of criticism when things are bad. Uh, but it takes a whole team to make things work. And I, I think we have some of the finest council members around. And I want you to please give the city council members a round of applause. And also, I could do what I do if it wasn't for a great staff. I'm very uh, blessed and fortunate to have a very dedicated, committed staff that really helps keep the trains going. Uh, Daisy Mitchell. Cynthia Ginyard, who's helping me, and uh, a former staffer. They, they never go away. Once you hire them, I don't care where they go. They, they still, he may not be on my payroll, but I still call him from time to time to help out. Lalu Davies. Um, 
there was uh, one elected official who walked in afterwards. I want to acknowledge Ann Williams from Alien ISD. Ann. And uh, it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, Loveless Mitchell from Senator Rodney Ellis' office. And the reason why I want to do that is because we have a very unique relationship that a lot of cities don't have. We have a great relationship at the state, local, and federal level. That's the way you get things done. It, it, it takes a collaboration. So uh, the way that Missouri City has been able to benefit, besides having great leadership in the mayor's office and a great city manager and, and great constituents, but also having great partnerships uh, with the state officials and the federal officials as well. And I'm excited today to, to give a kind of a brief overview of some things, some highlights from the 83rd legislative session. And unlike all the bad stuff that's going on in Congress, and we can all agree, regardless of whether you're Democrat or Republican or Independent, Libertarian, whatever you are, we can all agree that there's a whole lot of bad stuff going on in D.C., right? Is there anyone who doesn't think there's a lot of bad stuff? Who, who might that be? You know, whenever they, they have those polls and they show there's a 12% approval rating, I wonder who that 12% is. It must be their, their kids and their spouses, right? Who says that, yes, my dad or my mom is doing a good job. But, but, but seriously, there's so much dysfunction and so much chaos. And, and I personally think that there's a lot of people on both sides of the aisle who contribute to that chaos and dysfunction. You know, oftentimes people in political parties, they just want to demonize each other. And that, you know, that helps to score some political points. But at some point, you have to step back and go. At some point, you have to step, step back and do what the people elected you to do. And that's to represent everybody. And, and I don't think that we should look at people, everybody is the next election. We, we Caught, caught up in this vicious cycle of the next election and the next election. We had an election in 08, then we had an election in 10 and 12, and everybody's talking about 14, and then 16. You know, I think we should just take our time, focus on the here and now, and get things done for the American people. And that's one of the things we should do. And I think during the 82nd legislative session, the past session, Austin was getting similar to Washington. We had a lot of chaos, a lot of dysfunction. Some of you, you know that. A lot of members who were more senior than me, it was my freshman year, uh, they said it was the worst they'd ever seen. There was so much gridlock. It was so much partisanship. Now, part of that was we, we were dealing with some tough issues. We were dealing with redistricting. So it was kind of like, you know, feast of famine. You know, if you redistricting, it could have to determine whether or not you're coming back. So there were a lot of, you know, headbutting, rightfully so, I guess. And we dealt with some divisive issues or controversial issues, the sonogram bill, voter ID. Uh, we, we had a shortfall. We had to cut a lot of things. So the A second was a very, very, very tough and challenging session. And I'm thankful to God that the 83rd was a very productive session. We got back focused on the fundamentals of our state. And I can truly say, as I sit in this, as I address this audience, that we had less partisan bickering. We had a lot of bipartisan <coughs> bills that passed that would benefit Texans. Texans, and one of the biggest highlights that it, every session, only thing that we have to do, our constitution, unlike the federal government, just like our local city governments, we have to pass a budget. We can't carry forward debt. We have to balance our budgets. So. Whenever we balance our budgets, we have to set our priorities. And during the 82nd legislative session, one of my biggest disappointments was that we cut four point, what well, we cut five point four billion dollars from public education. And everybody knows we, that's horrible. The business community said it was horrible because in order for Texas to continue to lead the nation in job creation, we have to have an educated workforce. And we didn't send a good message when we cut that kind of uh, uh, funding from our schools. And as a result of that, schools like Fort Bend ISD, Lamar Consolidated, all the local schools, HISD, they sued the state of Texas saying that we failed in our responsibility that's deemed by the Constitution to adequately fund education. And I agree with that. I agree that the state of Texas failed each of you. We failed our future when we did that. 
I'm proud to say that this session, we made public education a priority again. We, we added about $4.5 back to public education. We didn't quite get everything, but we really got very close. So that was a very, very positive change from this session. A lot of, I know some people from HCC is here. Y'all took a very tight haircut last legislative session. This session, we were able to increase funding for our, our, uh, our school, our public, our higher education schools as well. So our community colleges, our four-year institutions, they received more money. And so this was a great session in terms of being able to fund our priorities. One of the other things that I was happy that we did when it came to public education was we made major, major, major reforms in the bill, and it's called House Bill 5. Some of you may be familiar with this. House Bill 5 did what a lot of teachers and educators, any educators, any teachers in the audience? I want to acknowledge my teachers or educators. Okay, a lot of teachers have been for years telling me and other legislators that we're getting sick and tired of teaching to the test. We're, we're losing our ingenuity to teach and be creative in the classroom. And as a result of that, a lot of teachers are leaving the classroom, or they're very frustrated with their jobs. In addition to being overworked and underpaid, we put all of these overburdensome tests that aren't conducive towards college readiness. The studies show that Texas leads the nation in the number of inner course exams that high school students have to take in order to graduate. And the number was 15. 15 tests. No other state had even 10. Now, the states that are ranked nationally with the best public education systems, they were averaging from three to five. So Texas was double and triple those states that had the best. And Texas isn't known as the best state for public education. I'm just being quite frank with you. And so we finally started, because of a lot of grassroots mobilization, a lot of engaged citizens, talking to legislators, coming to Austin, visit members' offices, and coming to their districts, writing letters. We finally listened and passed House Bill 5, which I was a proud co-author of, that, that reduced, significantly reduced the number of inner course exams from 15 to 5. Okay? That's a tremendous. And what is this going to do? This is going to allow teachers to actually teach the fundamentals to get kids ready for college. And House Bill 5 also allows more flexibility so that every kid who may not be able to go to college because they don't want to go to college. You know, we, we always strive for the best. We want people to, to, to aim to go to college. But there's some kids that just don't want to go to college, okay? They may not want to go. They may want to go later in life. Well, House Bill 5 also provides more flexibility where kids can get more uh, industrial type of certificates so they can come out and be able to have a certification when they graduate to hit the job force and to be able to go graduate from high school and get a certificate to go work in, the, in a job that they can make good wages. That was another thing that House Bill 5 did. It allowed more flexibility for, high, for graduating uh, high school students. So this was a major, major, major education reform. And I'm very, very pleased that all the people who were engaged in helping us to see the light. And this wasn't anything new. People have been saying it for a long time. But because more people were engaged, and it wasn't just all those teachers, they're lazy, they don't want to do any more work. It was parents. It was community activists. It was business people. And that's how we got that reform. So I'm very, very, that was one of the biggest, biggest, biggest accomplishments this session. Now, Another major accomplishment that we had uh, this session was we dealt, and then we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't deal with it until the special session, but we also, we all know that Texas is the fastest growing state in the country. In fact, Fort Bend County is one of the fastest growing counties, not just in Texas, I believe it's number two in, 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 in the state, but it's one of the fastest growing counties in the country, in the whole United States of America. That's because of people like the education, they like the, the community, the homes, uh, a combination of things. 
So as a result of that, we have more infrastructure and transportation needs, okay, with all the mobility. We dealt with transportation this session, during the special session, to come up with a way to add more money to uh, uh, funding for our roads and bridges and, and mobility. Now, you're going to see that as a, as a referendum, not this legislative, not this November, but next November. There's going to be a constitutional amendment to that, that I'm going to be talking to you about later, but I just want to give you a big picture of what we were able to accomplish this session. Transportation is a big deal, okay, in terms of congestion and gridlock, uh, improving maintenance on our roads. Uh, and you can look at the Trans-Texas Corridor, you can look at 99, you can look at so many different things and know we need to have more money dedicated towards transportation. And because of our, of our, of our state, we either do one of two things to raise revenue for whether it's education or, or transportation or prisons or whatever it is, we either increase revenue through have, having more people uh, uh, support services or we raise taxes. And in Texas, we most of us have agreed that we don't want to raise taxes. And so once we get into the next uh, constitutional amendment, you're going to have a chance to add more money for transportation through the rainy day fund. And the next thing that I want to talk about that's more current is something that's going to be on the ballot this that is, well, actually it's on the ballot now because we started early voting on Monday, is uh, the constitutional amendments. And if everybody should have received a newsletter that gives the what's on the ballot this November. We have nine proposed constitutional amendments. Nine proposed constitutional amendments. And I want to focus on one specific one, which is Proposition 6. Some of you may be familiar with this. Proposition 6 is very, very essential to the state of Texas. And the reason why is because there's something that we all have to have in order to live, and that's called water, right? Without it, people, plants, animals, and trees, they cannot exist. We drink it, we clean with it, bathe with it. We need to grow our food and manufacture many of the products we use every single day. We depend on water for our very existence. Yet only 3%, only 3% of the water in the world is fresh water. And most of that is actually frozen. Only, only 23% only 23, 23 of that is not frozen. Only half of that percent is available to supply every plant, animal, and person on Earth with water that they need to survive. That gives you some perspective on how important water is and why we need to ensure a safe and a steady stream of supply of water. Now, Texas lacks the adequate water supply that we need to meet the state's needs. Again, I told you that Texas is the fastest growing state in the country. Texas lacks the adequate water needs that we have for our growing demand. And a lot of you know that most recently we had some severe droughts. In, 20, in 2011, we experienced the worst single year drought in the history of the state of Texas. And today, almost 90% of the state is still experiencing drought conditions. Most Texans have felt the impact of the lack of water personally. A lot of cities have had uh, water restrictions, lost trees and landscapes, damage to foundations. A lot of farmers have had lost crops and revenue, uh, and that's impacted our farmers and ranchers. And businesses have also been impacted by the lack of water. Now, the fact is, unfortunately, we can't make it rain, but we can take active, proactive measures to fund water and conservation projects to help meet the state's water needs. Uh, and that is in House Bill that House Bill 4 that we passed in Constitutional Amendment 6. The, and so the money that will be on the ballot will help fund our water projects and help uh, us establish a water development program to meet the needs for the next 50 years. Uh, with, with your help, we'll be able to, to pass this bill and help meet the state's growing water needs. Now, 
here's some facts about uh, Proposition 6 that a lot of people may not be aware of because there's been some mis misinformation about it. House Bill, I mean, uh, Proposition 6 does not raise tax taxes on citizens or businesses. There's no tax increase at all. All of the $2 billion that would be approved in the proposition would be dedicated solely by the financing of comprehensive statewide water plan. This money would come from the, the state's economic stabilization fund that we commonly refer to as the state's rainy day fund. The rainy day fund will continue to be strong and available for other emergency, re emergency needs and will be left with a balance of seven billion plus. So this is a fiscally responsible way to address the long-term water needs of our state. Um, and so I'm asking you to help join with me to educate the public about the, the need to support um, all of the constitutional amendments, but specifically Proposition 6. Now, if you think about it, we would be we would have addressed all of the essential needs of our state in terms of the top priorities. I always start off with education being the state's number one priority because we have to look at our future. We have to look at educating our kids so that we have a strong workforce. We have to make sure that we have good transportation system to continue to sustain the growth that we have, and we have to have a viable source of water to do it. Now, there were some other things that we weren't able to do this session, and I want to talk a little bit about a few of those things. Um, one of the things that, and this is more, more of a local thing, um, one of the, well, let me just tell you another thing that we were able to do this session, and I want to specifically thank some of the people from HCC that helped partner with me to do this, was one of the high schools in, in uh, Fort Bend County, Will, Will Ridge High School, was not within the service district of a community college. And so one of the things that I was able to accomplish was to pass House Bill 3659 so that the students from Willow Ridge High School would be able to get in-service uh, status with a community college so that those kids could get uh, college credits while they're in high school without having to pay uh, uh, out-of-district tuition. So we were able to accomplish that. Um, one of the things that I like to see uh, Fort Bend ISD do as, as, as they go forward is similar to the structures that we have. If I look at myself or if I look at, you know, the city of Missouri City, the city of Missouri City is structured so that they have at-large council members and district council members, okay? That means that right now we're in uh, Florida Emory's district, and also we have an at-large member, Danny Wynn. Those members are elected single-member districts and at-large. Similar to a state representative, you have, you know, myself and, and, uh, and Fort Bend, you have District 26 and 28 and also 85. Those are pretty much single member districts. HISD is formed that way, Lamarcus Holiday. Fort Bend ISD is one of the largest, most diverse school districts that doesn't have a form of single member districts. It's, it's, one, of the, it's one of only 10 that, that, that is of the large school districts that doesn't have a former single member districts. I filed a bill that would have created single member districts in Fort Bend ISD. Wasn't able to quite accomplish that, but I think that going forward, we need to revisit that and hopefully uh, Fort Bend ISD will incorporate single member districts so that we can have more diverse representation throughout the entire district. And so that's <laughs> one of the things that I'm gonna be focusing on uh, in the next legislative session. Also, one of the things that I want to make sure that we continue to do is to have more, and, and, and I always get this from my cities, is to make sure that we have more local control. If I, didn't, if I don't learn anything from listening to my local mayors and council members is that we have so many unfunded mandates that we get each and every legislative session. So many things that we pass, and we don't know how it's going to impact our cities with respect to their already strapped budgets. And so I want to work sh to make sure that we have less unfunded mandates and more local control so that we can continue. Yeah, I thought you would, I thought you would agree with that. <laughs> so that we can make sure that we don't pass a lot of things that are more burdensome for, for to our local cities and municipalities and our school districts, our school boards, and not give them a financial means to do that. A lot of times what happens is we pass things well-intentioned, 
and we don't think about how they're going to fund this particular policy. And what ends up happening is the schools and the cities have to raise taxes. And so then everybody's pointing the finger at them, but it's in fact, it's, it, it, a lot of that stuff comes from Austin. And all we do is pass it and say, well, hey, you know, those guys need to do it. And we don't give them that, the necessary funding to do that. So I'm hoping as we continue to go forward and do things that we're more transparent with our budget so that when we pass these bills, we also talk about how these projects will be, uh, will be funded. Now, another thing that a lot of you probably are aware of is that starting right now, we uh, have everybody that goes to vote has to have some form of voter ID. And I'm sure because I know a lot of people in this crowd, you're educated, you're mobile, I would assume that you have a, a valid form of voter ID, which I put here. But I, I encourage you guys to be ambassadors, to talk to other people who you may assume has one to make sure they have a, an acceptable form of voter, of, of voter identification. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of people don't realize that even if you have a valid driver's license, if it's been expired, if it's been expired for more than 60 days, then that's not a valid form of identification. So if you have someone that may be not driving anymore, but they obviously they still vote, they're carrying a driver's license, it's expired. If it's expired more than 60 days, they have to get a voter identification certificate or some other acceptable form of identification if they're going to go and vote. And so a lot of people who may have what you would think on the face of it is an acceptable form of identification is not acceptable because of the new voter ID law. And so I wanted to... I wanted to make sure everyone had what those acceptable forms of ID are. And that's a, a valid Texas driver's license that hasn't been expired for more than 60 days, a Texas ID, a U.S. passport, a Texas concealed handgun license with a photo ID on it, a U.S. military photo ID, a U.S. citizenship certificate with a photo. And these are the only valid forms of identification that is going to be currently acceptable uh, with respect to voting. I get a lot of questions from people. Well, I have, I have a kid that's in college. They don't drive, they live on campus. They have a student ID that's issued from their college and university, a state issue. They can't use that to go vote. In the past, they may have been able to do that. It was acceptable. But now because of the new voter ID laws, those same college students will have to get one of these acceptable forms of identification in order to vote. And so every time I talk to a group of people, I say, do your civic responsibility, not just vote, that's great, but also talk to other people about the new voter ID laws, because a lot of people that I've assumed had, that met this criteria, they don't. And a lot of people who have elderly parents or grandparents who don't drive anymore, who are retired, they may not have a need to have a, a valid driver's license. Uh, if they don't have one of these acceptable forms of identification, they won't be able to vote. The only way that they'll be able to vote is if they request an absentee ballot. If they're over 65, they can request an absentee ballot. They can then vote by mail. But in terms of in-person voting, they would have to have one of these acceptable forms of identification. And so I would encourage you to be ambassadors, to be good stewards, and to, uh, to help spread the word to other people about the new uh, changes in the Texas voter ID law. And so that, that is something I wanted to, to bring up to this group. And finally, I want to talk to this group about the next legislative session. During, you know, Texas only meets once every two years. I mean, we, that's the way we meet. We don't meet every year. We meet. We met this year. We don't meet next year. We, we go back in 2015. And so during the interim, I'd like to hear from people about what are some of the things that you'd like to see done next legislative session? What are some of the laws that you think need to be changed, need to be amended? I know I hear from the council members about things that they like to see, but I also want to hear from people from the business community, people uh, from the employment community, people from the education community, uh, veterans. I want to hear from you. What are some of the things that you'd like to see changed? What are some of the things you'd like to see tweaked? What are some of the things you'd like to see done away with? Because sometimes we need to get rid of some of the bad laws that we passed. And so during the interim, I encourage people to stay engaged and involved. 
and contact my office. If I'm your state representative, please contact me to tell me what do you want to see going forward. What a lot of times people wait until the session starts, and Gary can attest to this, everything's in a frenzy once the session starts. It's very busy. We get bombarded by lobbyists and hundreds of people coming down. Now is the time when it's quiet, there's not a lot going on, that you can really focus on what do you like to see going forward. When the session starts, a lot of times it's already too late because we have to do our due diligence. If you tell me about something now, I can start doing the research and have my staff to start doing the research. And we can get, maybe even, we can even get a draft of the legislation from legislative council, start talking to, to people to build up support for it. And that way when the session starts and we file that legislation, we have a much more success of getting it, cha of getting it passed. And so what I'm telling this group is that if there's something that you'd like to see done, please contact me. If I'm not your state representative, contact your state representative about some of the things that you'd like to see going forward. And I can assure you that you'll get much more quality time with your, with your representative, and you'll get a head start upon the people that are waiting to get things done when the session starts. They think that's the only time we're doing things. But this is the most productive time because it's very quiet and we don't have to be in Austin unless we're going to a meeting. So now is a great time to be engaged, to start thinking about the next legislative session. And I'll give you an example. I talked about the passage of House Bill 5. House Bill 5 didn't get passed because people came in January of this year to start talking about education reforms. We were getting meetings throughout the summer and the fall and the spring about making these reforms. And if it wasn't for those town hall meetings that people showed up at to say, we want to push this, we want to push that, those one-on-one -on -one meetings in people's uh, members' offices, we wouldn't have passed House Bill 5. And so that's what I want you to get to thinking about for the next session is what are some of the, the things that you'd like to see us accomplish going forward? Uh, and and that, that way, when the session starts, we will, we will have done our homework, we will have packaged a bill, we will have uh, got people. And lot, here's another, the last thing about a bill is that there's all usually, unless it's some real uncontroversial bill, House Bill 5 had a lot of critics. There were a lot of people who were critics of that. So when you have ahead of time, you can, you can do damage control. You can talk about to the people who think it's a bad idea. And sometimes you have to recraft a bill. You have to compromise and negotiate to, be, to get an agreed to bill. And then that's when you really see things take off. You get a bill sponsor that has his big, biggest critic before because they've got a chance to sit in the back to work out the details. And now this bill is ready to go. That's the way bills move. And the people who get things done, they do their homework. And they get with the people who are opposed to them. Because those are the same people that are going to be trying to kill the bill the next session. And so if there's something that you'd like to see done, I always tell people, well, hey, I know, I think such and such, this is a good idea, but such and such I know is against this. I think you should get with them, talk to them about this bill, and you, you guys kind of work some things out. Believe me, that works. That really, really works. And, I, and the mayor talked about how I've been able to get bills done. A lot of it is because I'm able to get people together in a room to kind of talk about things. And a lot of times the bill isn't the way it was originally drafted, but because of some compromise language, we get a better bill, right? So that's what I wanted to leave you with today is to stay engaged, stay involved. And I think that way when we start the next legislative session, if there are some things that this community needs, we'll be prepared and well ahead of the curve. And now I just want to take a few minutes to answer any, any questions or receive any comments. Any feedback you can give me, if you want to give it to me offline, that's, that's great. But if you have anybody here, uh, I think we have a few minutes, we can uh, address any, any questions or anything that someone has. I have a question. Um, my mother is from my mother is from Pennsylvania. My mother is 90 years old. I'm going to try to her, um, first of all, to say that she's a resident of Texas. And to get her so she could vote. Well, her driver's license had expired, had not expired in Pennsylvania. They, they gave me a list and said, This is what you need. I got all that information, brought it back up to the DPS. When I got back there, she said, Oh, well, you need to show proof of residence. I'm like, What? You need a water bill, light bill, some kind of bill showing where she lived and who she lived with. Well, that doesn't show that it was a bill. So, well, we got that together. 
went back up there, and then they said, oh, she needs a birth certificate. I'm like, a birth certificate? She doesn't have her birth certificate. I have a passport. No, that won't work. So I don't know what's going on. Is your mother, she was, is she with you? Okay, uh, but she's local. I, I I like to help her with that. She's here. Okay, okay, yes. Let let my office help her with that. I, I mean, there are some requirements. Birth certificate. There are some requirements to show uh, proof of residency and things of that nature. But we can help you work through that. I mean, that there there are some 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 new parameters in terms of uh, the voter ID bill. But I, I'll be glad to help my have my staff help you to help your mother to get the necessary identification that she needs because we don't want to produce any hurdles. One of the things about voting is it's a fundamental right. I mean, I, I don't want anybody to be disenfranchised from not having the ability to vote because they don't have the necessary form of ID. So we want to make sure that we can help your mother to get that expedited. There's a question in the back. Well, my name is Karen Robinson, and I've been looking at the news and covering the new issue in Texas. And it's called Gun Women Are Concerned Voting, where if their name is on the voter certificate is different from their driver's license, that there are certain hurdles that they have to uh, present and the judge at that particular precinct will make the determination if there is any problem. There was a lady on one of the shows last night that was a judge that wasn't able to vote and one of the provisions is to have the, your original uh, certificate, your wedding right. certificate, which is probably hard for people that have been married quite a while. What is your office doing at this point to educate the voters of this particular new voter ID for married women that may have a hyphen name or a different type of last name from their job? Well, that's a good that's a good question. And, and, and some people may be familiar with it because it made national attention and national news yesterday. Uh, there was a state district judge that her name was different. Her maiden name was different, obviously, from her married name. And she was challenged when she went to vote. And she said that she had been voting like this for the last 49 years. Uh, well, that's a, it's a true story. And so uh, one of the things that, that we are, are trying to encourage people is to work with the county clerk's offices. Of, and like, you know, I know in, in Fort Bend we have a good county clerk that is training the election and the poll workers to make sure that when they look at that identification, if they can show that it's substantially similar and the person has... And, and it's unfortunate that that issue just came up because that wasn't quite anticipated when we passed this legislation. It wasn't anticipated that we would be excluding a lot of people because of their, their married name. So we're going to have to make some provisions going forward to make sure that no one is disenfranchised. And what so everybody knows, even if someone says that you can't vote because you don't have the necessary the, the identification doesn't meet the the, uh, the voting roll. Well, you can vote, and you just have to vote a provisional ballot, and then you can bring the proof back, and then your vote will be allowed to count. I know that's an additional hurdle, and it's unfortunate, and we have to work through that, but that's the way that they're doing it now, that if someone has a challenge at the, at the voting booth, they can vote a provisional ballot, and then get the issue clear, cleared up, within the, the time frame, and then their vote will be counted. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping that not many people will be uh, uh, set back from voting, but that is an issue we're, we're actually working working through now. Well, I'll have an election judge. We just went through the whole big training exercise, and I have a lot of leeway to take care of that. <laughs> Okay, one last question and then we'll, we'll do the drawing. Yes, ma'am. You had your hand up for a while. Thank you so much for representing us so well. Thank you. And my question has, is concerning uh, immigration reform. Okay. Now, we know or we're expecting that to be the next big mess up in Washington, D.C., and the gridlock and whatnot. And of course, Texas would be disproportionately affected by whatever happens with all of that stuff that's going back and forth. So, my question to you. Is that what are you doing to work with my representative, which is our uh, Congressman Al Green, and possibly our state senators, so that Texas, we can ensure that what's really going on, I mean, immigration reform done properly would actually be good for our state. So I'm wondering what you and uh, other representatives <coughs> are doing to work with our federal liaison, including 
our Republican <laughs> senators to ensure that Texas's voice is heard loud and clear as these discussions and debates go on? Excellent, excellent, excellent question and comment. I can tell you that I'm in favor of immigration reform. Mm -hmm. I'm in favor of a pathway to citizenship. And I think that uh, going forward, we need to have some form of uh, Im immigration reform in, in our country. I mean, everyone pretty much agrees with that. The solution is, is convoluted. Uh, right now, there's a Senate bill that was passed, and the House is in, in favor of that. So there's going to be a lot of work and a lot of, uh, I think, uh, back and forth to come up with some comprehensive form of immigration. I think that what I'm doing and what any of you guys can do is to contact your congressional member and your delegation to tell them your stance on immigration reform and where you stand. Because it's a federal issue, I don't have a vote, but I do have a voice. And I have voiced you know, my concern to my congressman, which is Pete Olson, that I would like to see immigration reform done now. And so uh, that's gonna be a serious, intense debate it's going to be very, uh, very passionate. People are very passionate when it comes to immigration reform, you know, on both sides of the aisle and in between. There's a lot. There's there's a lot of uh, chaos because it's a controversial issue. But what I would tell everybody in this room is that you know, tell your congressional member where you stand on it, just like I do. And your your state rep or your state senator, they have a voice, but they don't have a vote. And we certainly would use our voice to make our voices heard. But everyone has the same equal opportunity to, to, to contact their congressional member to tell them to take a proactive stance to do something about immigration. Texas, like you said, is, it will... The nation will look at Texas as, as the leader when it comes to the immigration debate because of the large number of immigrants that we have in our state. So Texas will be, I think, at the forefront of, of the debate when it comes to immigration. And we want our congressional members to be a very open to the, to, the, to the needs of the state when it comes to immigration reform. We, we've talked about some things at the state level, but for the most part, it's a federal issue. And we pretty much, you know, defer to them for to lead those discussions. And I want to thank everybody for coming. I think we have to go out. Thank you. We also have something for you. You know, earlier this year, we took a delegation from Missouri City uh, for the capital visit, and we have a picture of that visit, and we want you to hang that in. Oh yeah. <laughs> This was, Missouri, this was Missouri City Day at the Capitol. This was one of the, the, the proudest days that I had as a member. To pass a resolution and recognize the city of Missouri City Day at the, at the Capitol, the first annual, because yeah. we're going to do it next session. That's right. And I invite each of y'all to come down. on Charlie Adam, we came, and we had other people in the room that came from, from Missouri yeah, City. But be a part of this. There was a lot of, of, of people that were very impressed. Other members with how uh, active and engaged our delegation was. They went around and met with all the other members. They came bearing gifts. And so people come from a delegate person like me. That's right. So y'all be part of this again next year. Thank you. Well, I'll have to give you another copy of the history book. And I know you have one of those in your office, but uh, you never have another one. Right. Thank you. <laughs> we do have some door prizes. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Let me remind everybody that uh, our November uh, leadership luncheon is actually going to be a tour, and it's on Friday, November the 15th, and we're going to take a tour of Houston's Transtar Center. This is the major control center that's in Houston that controls all the traffic cameras and everything in the city of Houston. So it's going to be a very interesting tour. We'll, it's, it is a Friday because they don't give tours except, uh, I think, on Mondays and Fridays only. So that's why we're doing a Friday. But November 15th, we'll get a notice out on that. So we do have some door prizes. Uh, since I've got this one in my hand, this is from Ray Aguilar, right? Very great. I had, to, I had to go back to work anyway. Again, this is for an oil change, a tire rotation, and a complete car wash at a Classic Chevrolet, Ray Aguilar. So let's see who we got. Everybody need a car wash? Yes. How about Vivian Burley? Oh.